Before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. This is the Yoakum Strength Podcast with me, your host, Austin Yoakum. And on this episode of the podcast, we have the legendary Greg Sodders, owner of Standard Jiu-Jitsu. And on this episode of the podcast, Greg takes us down the rabbit holes of the ecological dynamics approach to jiu-jitsu, how he creates change in his athlete's technique through small-sided games, and why he isn't daddy. This is a legendary podcast with an even better dude, and I hope you get as much out of it as I did. Thank you guys for listening. Keep chopping wood. Before we hit the intro music, I wanted to introduce to you guys the Yoakum Strength Insider. The Yoakum Strength Insider is our online training platform that takes all of the ideas that we talk about on this podcast and implements them into a program that is available to you at the touch of your fingers. Our goal with the Yoakum Strength Insider is to create better movers, to level up your life, and to move forward from where you are. We do this in a holistic fashion. Not only will you receive a program that has helped hundreds of people become better movers, you'll also receive access to our app that allows you to track everything, has video links for all exercises, and allows you to be in constant communication with a Yoakum Strength Coach. Along with this, you'll get our 30-page PDF nutrition and lifestyle guidelines that includes everything from what to eat, how much of it to eat, why we're eating it, meditation habits, and other lifestyle habits that we implement with our clients to really level up their lives. If you're interested in trying out one of these programs, use Podcast 25 in the discount section right before you pay for 25% off your first program. Boom. This is the Yoakum Strength Podcast. Take the leap down the rabbit hole with us as we interview elite level guests to unravel what high performance really is. I will right, well, coach. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you here. Thank you, sir, man. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we were, I was just talking about how uh, back in the day I got started with um, Rob Gray and like their emergence group back in like 2017, 2018. And Sean Mishka would have these movement meetups and he would talk all, and he was working with Everson Griffin and the Vikings at the time. And he was talking all the time about like breaking the mold that is football and with this new approach, with this uh, approach that they feel like is the future for skill acquisition and just learning and, and preparing an athlete for what they're going to see, the movement problems they're going to see. And then I was sent to your page and I, I just had never thought of it in the jujitsu world or the martial arts world, but had never thought of applying this to the world just because I'm not in it. But when sure. I was sent to your page, that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, oh my God, we complain about breaking our mold in football and the jujitsu wrestling world. I have never met an MMA world, whatever the fighting world. I have never met a world where it is more culty and more tradition based and more like we are sticking to the old school methods of like Rocky training uh, and we're never going to break from that. So <laughs> I, I just love to love to hear your approach of like how, oh, how yeah. you get to the ecological approach in jujitsu in the fighting world. And how have you tried to break the mold with this? Yeah. So, well, I felt the same thing too. And, uh, you know, I came from a traditionalist background Like my original coach is a man named Lloyd Urban, who was heavy into uh, what he, uh, high repetition static drilling. And not only that was he's a very authoritative man. So he likes things the way he likes them. And so uh, he was always trying to funnel us through this uh, traditionalist mindset, you know, say this, do this. Uh, it has to be done this way. These very absolutist specific things. And, you know, and again, I was committed to the process. I did it exactly how he said he was supposed to do it, but I just never found what I was looking for through that approach. I felt like it was broken. It just didn't, it wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, and so when I was eventually went off on my own to start my own school, I asked myself, is this really the way that I want to be doing it? Is this really effective for me just to have my students sit down, do this silly warm up, listen to me talk, you know, grappling theory or traditional theory uh, for a while and then have them static drill for another 40 minutes? Like, I don't know. I just wanted a different way. I, I knew it didn't work. I could tell that it didn't work and I, I needed to find something else. And so that I did the same thing as you. I, I bounced into uh, I bumped into Rob Gray and the embodiment guys as well. And I started going down those rabbit holes. <clears throat> so did you ever um, experiment with on, with it on yourself and in the jujitsu world before you kind of took it to your school in school? Or, or like, what was that? What was the very first experience of like applying it? Because also learning about this and other things, like learning about the ecological approach is different from creating games, small-sided games, like creating things and creating a program around it, especially in a sport in which it hasn't been done before. So I like to hear that experience, like learning about it and then be like, oh shit, I could do this here. Like, did you experiment with yourself? How did you kind of take that from there? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I did. So uh, the first paper I ever read uh, was a, a paper by 
uh, late Michael Turvey, who just passed away last week, about um, self-organization. And it was uh, very convincing. I, I just like, oh, we're doing that too. Like, and, and it's, it, for some reason, I guess it was because of these thoughts I was already thinking about, about how I knew training in this way didn't work. This method wasn't producing the skill that I wanted it to. And then when I read that supportive paper, I was like, I'm just going to try this. And of course I started with myself because I did not know how to create a class around it. So what I decided to do was I wasn't going to focus on any moves anymore. I was just going to try to do what I considered the base level of grappling. So for example, and I always say the same thing to everybody, uh, in a grappling situation, we uh, either start on the feet, we start on the ground, one person top, one person bottom in front of each other's legs, and then one position where I'm past the legs, top and bottom. So I decided to focus solely on those positions and just tried to do what I would consider foundational behavior. Like how long could I stay on top? Could I stay on top no matter how the alignment was going, what grips my partner had on me? So I would start with very basic behaviors that had no definitions because I realized, I said this before on a mother podcast, there was this mess that was going on in between starting a situation and ending with a move. There was this, this human action that was happening. And I realized we didn't have language to describe this human action. So anyway, I started to experiment on myself just by setting task goals. What I was going to accomplish today in training, in this moment in training, in this round in training. And then I would take notes on how I felt my performance was going, how I felt my learning was going. And then every time I discovered something that I thought worked well for me, I'd write it down as important. Mm -hmm. And then I would try to apply it to my class. So I started working on application right away. What was your, when you were experimenting with yourself, what was your... It, you said you felt like it worked. Like what, what was that kind yeah. of, did, did you notice like in a pretty instant, like the, I, I'm learning skills faster. I'm feeling better in this, in this um session. Like, like how, what were, what were you grabbing onto where you got to a point of, Oh shit, I'm reading this stuff and it's actually working. And this could actually be the future. What was that like for yourself? Were, were you just learning way faster? Well, it's not that I was learning way faster. It's that the typical problems I was having, I wasn't having anymore. So if my only goal was, let's say to stay on top and hold you down, I didn't care how I approached that. So it, it almost felt like I was experiencing what was happening in real time. I wasn't searching back in my mind being like, what was, how did I do this again? Where are my hands supposed to go? That shit just started to go away. And it's like, I started focusing uh, just on the task and I, it, it, it g gave me this implicit feeling like, you know, everyone calls it the flow state. I don't know if that's even a thing, but uh, I feel like I was experiencing something like that. Hmm. Yeah. You know? and well, and it, it makes sense too, because it's like, I, I talk all, all the time about like creating movement problem solvers. Like if you just create athletes that can solve the movement problems in front of them and just give them all the tools to solve and, and use the tools to solve the movement problem in front of them, however they want to solve it. And, and in the American football world and the team sport world, it's like, I'm just going to give you this hammer and you're going to have to use the hammer for every single situation, <laughs> you know, like we're never actually yeah. working on solving movement problems. And a lot of it's like, I, I talk about this a lot of times too. It's like a lot of it's like very coach ego led because it's like, it gets clean. If we do it the other way, it gets clean and continually gets cleaner. And that feels good as a coach. It's like, it started off sloppy. Now it's super clean, but it's like your, your drill or your, your specific tool got cleaner. That that's, that's not utilizing right. that tool and not having them solve it. They're not getting better at solving these movement problems and in front of them, they're just getting better at using your tool. Yeah, they're getting better at replicating what you're telling them to replicate. You know, that's actually a sign that I think practice is going poorly. <laughs> so uh, if we engage at the beginning and they start to look very clean by the end, I'm like, hmm, maybe the task was too simple. Maybe I made it too obvious. Uh, there's a, actually a basketball coach named Trevor Reagan. I don't know if you know who he is. Uh, his whole thing is train ugly. Mm. If practice looks messy, it means learning is going on. If practice looks clean, it means the challenge isn't high enough. They already know what they're doing. So the, it's the kind of goals you want a little bit of both. You don't want the shit so messy that it's breaking off into pure chaos, undefinable chaos, because then no skills really might, might emerge, right? But if it's like super clean and you can notice everything, maybe the challenge is not so high. So you want an in-between. You want lots of mistakes, lots of failures, but with little blips of what you would see as success or movement solutions. And this is a, a sign for me that practice is going well. Boom. Hold yeah, on. I just wrote Hold a whole second. article. Can you hear these guys in the background? No, not at all. I'm telling Fantastic. you, that is the best headset I've ever seen. Because <laughs> I can see them get after it and you can't hear it. And they're like pissing me off. I'm hearing them talking about I'm the fucking yell. I'm sorry, sorry, language. I'm goddamn. It's like how rude, right? So no. <laughs> oh. sorry if you can hear that. No, no, no. Um, but uh I, I just wrote a whole article for Simply Faster on uh embracing the mess and embracing the the chaos. And that that's something how so this is something I'm always interested in for there's a lot of analytical coaches where it's very hard for them to do so. Uh, and for I, sure. And this is where I have to get a more compassionate side because I am 
I'm a creative. Like I, I, I like the chaos. That that's just how my brain kind of operates, and and I like the beauty that's in there, and I, I like operating in that world. But you have a lot of analytical coaches, and they're very good. Co- there's there's still good coaches, and and it's one of the things that makes them a superpower is they're super fine detail, super small detail. But it really like they they don't process it that well. Have did you have the issue? Did you start off as a creative, or how do you work with coaches that that, that they struggle with embracing the chaos? So I'm an analytical coach. Right. But so it's, I'm, I'm a strange mix, right? I thrive in chaos. Like my very first Jitsu class I ever had to teach. Uh, I was work. I was a blue belt. I'd been training for maybe six months, right. Or almost a year. I don't remember whatever I was. I was a young beginner. My, my coach at the time was like, Hey, I want to give you a five to seven year old program and, learn, and teach kids. Are you interested in that? I'm like, Oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to learn some stuff about coaching kids or whatever. He's like, great. I got 20 kids coming tomorrow. You're up. And I'm like, Oh shit. Like, so I had to like perform a class in front of 20 parents and these wild ass little five and seven year old kids running around. And I was able to hold it together. So again, I thrive in chaos too. But at the same time, I'm very analytical. I, I like to know what's going on. So I realized really early in this new coaching journey I took with the ecological approach um, that there's a difference between the language of analyzing and the language of coaching. They're two different things. So let's say a coach is looking at why a movement solution emerges, right? They're looking at something they want to analyze it. They want to break it down into it's all the finer details. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't deliver it like that back to your students because that's not how they're experiencing it. So the goal is to take what we know to be true and filter it through an an opportunity mechanism. We need to create some type of mechanism in the practice where we give the students the opportunity to see it the way we see it, but without telling them so. So again, I think there's room for that, right? So we can be these strong analyzing minds while at the same time using what we've what we've analyzed to inform a better way to organize practice. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I think, both extremes like have their have their value, but I think it's uh, dead set in the middle that we we need to be. We actually we have a coach in our sport named John Danaher. He's a he's a world famous coach. He's considered the greatest coach in our sport, but he's the opposite of me. He's very very analytical, and he uses this analytical approach to create his practices. So he's creating his practices with this explanation, these fine details, this do it this way. This is optimized. Though he does have some success with it. I do see some hiccups in his athletes, even his high-level athletes, that I think could be erased if he if he did it in a different way. Mm. And, and that that's one of the things that I liked about when I've uh, I was looking at your page and you're talking about high, your high-level athletes of how uh, you said something along the lines of like you don't care what the spectators say, you know, like how how the movement problem is solved. I, I thought this was really cool because it's like it doesn't matter how the movement problem is solved. It just matters that it's solved. It matters that the job right. is done, that the task is done. And honestly, some of that unorthodox part of it is probably what makes these athletes so successful. In the football world, you see it, and basketball world specifically, it's like you'll, you'll have the best jumpers in the world jump a different way, and you'll have these landing mechanic and like injury prevention experts like look at them and be like, oh, he's jumping wrong, he's jumping wrong. He's like, that dude's jumping 60 inches. Like he is solving the movement <laughs> problem in an unorthodox way that allows him to do what he does. And I can see the same thing in, in, in your world where it's like, that dude is just murdering that other guy, but he's doing it wrong. Like, how, what, what are you saying there? And it's just like this paradox that we kind of create. So I'd like to know like kind of your, your thought your thought process with that and like how, how you kind of deal with that. Well, I think there's, the, the reason exists in our community, I think maybe even a little more than yours is actually because of who comes in. So you're lucky that you're dealing with real athletes. You're dealing with the fastest, most powerful men on the planet, you know, depending on what level you're coaching football. So you're dealing with these uh, wonderfully skilled movers who have been organizing like this since they were children. You know, They were throwing rocks at their friends and climbing on trees and jumping over each other and being competitive since day one. So now when you get them filtered through this, you know, this football mechanism, you get this wonderful outcome. And if they didn't do it their own way, they probably wouldn't be as successful because that's how they got here in the first place. However, so I think in your field, you, you sort of have this already kind of built into it. With us, our sport is pedestrian. So anyone who walks in off the street can jump in and try a class. So we're dealing with people who are overweight, dealing with people who are non-disciplined, psychologically fragile, uh, that have strange expectations of what they think the martial arts world is. People don't even consider this a sport. You know, they don't even realize that it's a game that we're playing. Like, Mm -hmm. it's bad. So I have all these things that I have to organize practice around. Like I've said before on podcasts that my main goal actually is not at first not to teach jiu-jitsu. It's to break your expectations so I can start teaching you jiu-jitsu. So I think uh, one of the biggest fears in our sport is how we – behind how we create practice is the reason we have to explain things in detail or in in the right way is because people will get injured. No, man. Like, sport is is, is a risky thing to play in. 
And the way you organize practice doesn't protect people. It lies to people. So they don't have to take that risk of potentially getting injured. But we have ways that we can mitigate that without ex over explaining shit to our students, letting them move on their own and fail on their own and fall around because that's what's going to teach them ultimately. Uh, but anyway, I, I, yeah, um, my experience with that is we have to let the athlete be the athlete. You know, you have to let what comes out of them come, come, come out of them. We can't let, you know, the, the, excuse my language, but fatty who comes in here dictate what the athletic guy is going to be doing. We can't, we can't let that happen because then we're damaging one dude for the other guy. And so I don't know, man, I, I let the athlete be the athlete in my room. God, that the, your, your, the way you put that over like practice is just lying to them though. It is so true. It's like that, that, that that's what we are doing as coaches. And it's I, the other, it's like um the, the AT world and the PT world and the rehab world is really, really bad with this too, because it's like, I I've seen some PTs and re, rehab in quotations. They don't, they don't do anything, but they're so far away removed from the athlete. They never give that athlete any stimulus. They just, okay. them. they send them off to whatever team that they're going to. Uh, and they lied to them throughout this whole rehab process. Like we're doing good. We're doing good. We're doing good. You're, you're never adding in any real stimulus or any perception reaction, anything like that into your training, into your rehab, you send them back off your sport. Now you're far enough away, removed from that athlete to where it's not your fault anymore. Uh, but you just lied to them during that whole recap process, sent them off their sport. And of course they get hurt again. You know, like they, they weren't actually stimulated. They weren't actually ready for their thing. So the, the, the process I talk about like selling the snake oil, like so many coaches and PTs and rehab world that like, it's just selling the snake oil. How much snake oil can we sell to our athletes and just lie to them to pretend like we are getting them results? Oh, 100%. I think because it's the, I, I, I guess I say this all the time. It's the sales and marketing machine that pushes this shit, not the result. Right. If we were result based, we'd be honest. We would tell people right away, you're probably going to get hurt doing this. This is probably not going to feel good. Uh, we're going to try to minimize that to, to the best of our ability, but we don't have any certainty that this won't hurt you. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. You know what I mean? So why would it exist here? And so rather than, you know, comfort them by lying to them about their fears, we should just help, help manif uh, put their fields in a manifold. And be like, okay, if we act in this way, it could be less dangerous. You know, I don't know. And I, and of course, I know with the, the PT world, they're dealing with a vast array of person. They're dealing with, you know, a 65 year old, you know, ex athlete with arthritis or maybe a guy who's never moved his whole life who fell down and hurt his knee. And then you have a college guy coming in, a D1 guy who needs completely different medicine, but they're they're treating them all as the same person. So, yeah, I mean, we have the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so with with this approach and this is one thing that I was actually really interested in is. What has been the pushback from the the, the jujitsu MMA kind of world from other coaches and on? Because I know it's like just just talking to I, I train a lot of jujitsu guys that come into our gym, not oh, in jujitsu, just just sports performance wise, just getting them ready, do, sure. doing the lifting, all of those things. Um, and, and they talk about how culty it is, and just like how like yeah. and or culty like just old school, just some of the things that they say, and like they if they're coming to me, they're usually they're decently at like they're 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 in the sports performance world. They they found me because they were in the sports performance world right. in the first place, so they kind of know and they're like, oh my god, you should hear some of these guys talk. They're amazing jujitsu teachers, or some of the things that they say. It's just but anyways, the the cult world and grabbing onto the old school world. Have you experienced any backlash when you you talk about gamifying this stuff and creating small sided games and having this ecological approach? Yeah. So I hear a few things. So the first thing that's really weird is that people start off first by saying, oh, this is nothing new. This is just situational sparring. So they start off with this really loose definition of what they think I'm doing, and they filter their criticisms through that. So that's really strange. So rather than try to try to reach out to me and talk to me what I'm actually doing, they're just like what, you know, my, my boy Scott says, he says, we're putting uh, new, uh, new wine in old bottles. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or the way around old wine in new bottles. Um, and so that's the first criticism I get, that what I'm doing is not new because it looks like something else. But again, they don't know what I'm doing because when I ask them, well, what am I doing? That's not new. And they're Grr. they can't explain it. Right. So that's the first criticism I get. The second criticism I get is that you can't only train live because live um, interaction doesn't produce skill. OK, great. Why? Why do you think that it doesn't work like this, even though as a child, your whole life, you learned without having anything explained to you? You learned how to walk without explanation. You learned how to talk without explanation. You learned how to run around the playgrounds with your friends and not fall down without explanation. You learned how to do all the things that you do without ever having me explain to it. But now all of a sudden you need this deep explanation on what you're supposed to do. So nobody can tell me why uh, it can't be done this way. Uh, and also I'm doing it this way. So <laughs> I don't know what they're saying. So I, I let people come in for free. I'm like, hey, come check out my program. Come train with us. I want to show you that it actually works this way. Um, so yeah, it's the, uh, the uh, you're just doing 
the same old shit. They're calling it something new to market. So that's the first criticism I get. The second is, like I said, it doesn't, you need things explained to you. It doesn't work on beginners. Uh, and then lastly, that live training causes injuries. Um, and what's funny is uh, I've been open for nine years. And the only injuries that we've sustained here are either from visitors, which is true. We've had visitors hurt each other. We haven't had any of my guys hurt each other. And I'm not saying that to try to protect ourselves. I'm dead serious. Uh, and the other thing is overuse injuries, like where people don't respect their own bodies and they beat themselves to shit and end up getting hurt because of it. But we don't have any injuries in the practice. Anyway, th these are the common criticisms I get. And how are you battling them? Like, what, what's your uh, what's your kind of approach to it? Do you just deal with it and keep going forward? Well, well <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm always going to keep going forward because these guys are really, they're not really criticizing me. They're they're having an emotional reaction to what they think I'm saying, and then they're playing out their insecurities as arguments. It's not it's not a real thing. It's like they have no effect. Uh, however, I do want to, I don't want them to be the loudest people in the room. So I try to engage the best I can through creating a little bit of content on our page. I've done 15 podcasts, I guess. So I'm trying to talk to as many people as I can to get this message out in our community that this is the way it's done. And here's why. And I've talked to a wider range of podcaster. I've talked to professionals from, let's say, Rob Gray's sense, and then just a typical layman who just, man, they want to hear about it. I, I've talked to the whole range so that there's kind of somewhere any person can start to hear what I'm trying to say. So that's why I would try to combat it. And of course I, I jump on Reddit every now and then and talk shit in the comments, but. Yeah. And has, has it been any, I, cause when, when I look at, especially like the, the small set of game stuff that, that you've hosted, like that seems like it's getting massive reach. H have you seen other gyms adopt this kind of method? Yeah. So not to just talk about the people who are, are my haters or whatever, but no, I've received tons of great feedback. I mean, like I said, I've, I've been known, in this community doing this thing specifically for about a year. And I've literally talked to over a thousand people. I spend, you know, like I told everyone, four to eight hours on messenger and on the phone a day, just talking to people, trying to spread the word, trying to tell people how I'm doing this. Uh, I've done coaches groups already. Uh, I've done a bunch of stuff. So no, I'm getting a lot of great feedback for how people are receiving the games. A lot of people feel like this is going to get rid of the waste in our sport. It's mm -hmm. going to get rid of the traditionalism in our sport. And a lot of people are ready. They're ready to jump on board. They want to, they want to know how to do it. They want to know how to implement it in their own classes and, and in their own program. So I'm helping out to the best of my ability, but yeah, no. I, so I'm receiving a lot of, of good things. A lot of people like it. They, they think it's a, a quote, breath of fresh air. I hear that a lot. Well, and that, that's something in the, and, and I would like to hear your thoughts in, in your field too, but getting rid of the waste in football uh, we talk about injury prevention and all of these things. And like one of the biggest things is just the volume we have at a football practice, but it's just wasted volume. Like it's like, it's just volume because we are supposed to be practicing for two hours. We are supposed to be doing this for, we're supposed to stay busy. That's what it is. Like coaches need yeah. to stay busy. So we have this, so we have just like this crazy amount of volume on soft tissues. And then we have injuries when we go through where is what you saying, getting rid of waste, that's probably the number one thing you can do to prevent injuries. So where they're yes. saying like, you can't go live, like, or you're going to get hurt, all these things. It's like we're, we're cutting off so much just crap and we're just focusing on what matters. And honestly, you could have, you could have an argument there for that's a reason why a lot of your guys aren't getting hurt that way. No, exactly right. I mean, we do do a two hour practice, but the reason we do a two hour practice is because jujitsu is not intense. Like it's, it's basically we're, we're working in like zone two, zone three cardio. We're not really, and we're not doing any absolute movements, no maximal weight. I mean, it's we're interacting with another human with a human body. It's very, uh, it, it's very, it's taxing, but it's not intense. So because of this, and because it's a complex and continuous skill, it takes high volume and high frequency to stabilize and develop that skill. So we do have to train for quite some time. But however, we don't have a warm up, so we're not doing running or push ups or jumping to 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 fatigue the body. Okay, there's no pre fatigue going on before uh, skill acquisition can start. We're also not doing any dead static drills, which is the just moving your body in one repeated motion over and over and over and over again. That's injurious on soft tissue. We already know this. So again, like you said, we're taking away these, these fatiguing mechanisms and allowing most of that fatigue to go towards live resistance skill acquisition. And so this is what makes it a more efficient practice. And like if you're a new person, a beginner, you only do an hour class. And if we were to like break everything down between me speaking, rest periods, whatever, you're only doing about 40 minutes of live work. Like if you take all the other stuff into account. So again, that's not intense. Anybody can do that every day. Anybody. So, yeah. So with, with that, have you noticed uh, the ability to go at a higher frequency with, with <laughs> yeah. this type of method, actually? Yeah. So uh, we were, so me and uh, one of my, my best guys, a, a guy named DeAndre Corbett, he came to me three years ago, already as a, a good player. He was already a black belt. 
he was a young black belt and really wasn't having much success. So he came through because he was dating one of my students. So we met each other and we just kind of had this instant coach student relationship. We just, we got each other, you know? And so I asked him, I was, we, were, we actually, we were hanging out. We were listening to like Ido Portal. Portal we were talking about him. And Hell he yeah. said, and Ido was like, if you're not willing to break your students, you, you can't discover anything. And so I was like, Hey man, you want to see how, how fucking, how much volume we can do? And he's like, yeah. I was like, all right, let's go. So me and he and I and a bunch of other guys decided to test the volume limit of our, of our sport. So how many rounds did we do a day continuously for seven days a week until we broke until like we started having emotional problems and couldn't sleep and started having like fatigue issues. And uh, we noticed that it, there was some variation, but typically uh, the guys didn't start breaking till around six months of no days off 10, 10 minute rounds every single day. Six six months. So we found that there is an upward limit, <laughs> but then we just reduced it from that, and then now we have what we consider a, a sustainable practice schedule. <clears throat> nice. Uh, and one of the things that you, you just talked about, how you had a black belt come to you. Um, what's the difference in applying this method to a black belt that is already like they've they've gone through the traditional method and now they're they're switching over versus starting with somebody raw that hasn't gone through. Have you noticed differences between those yes. two teaching those two this method? What what what's that gonna like for you? Uh, that's a great question. So the first one is the the black belt can't comes to me already has habits. He already has good habits, right? He's there to train. He knows what jujitsu is. He's competed. He has all these like psychological and physical habits that I do not have to build into him. So all I have to do is clean him up technically. I can focus almost all of his practice on skill development. I don't have to focus on any of the other shit because I know that he's going to take care of it. And this is another reason why DeAndre grows so quickly because, again, he already has all the good habits. Uh, we actually joke, we call him the demon monk because he lives like a monk. Uh, I mean, he, he should be a professional athlete in some other sport. He just chose this amateur sport, right? He's, he's the guy that would have been the gold medal Olympian. You know, that, that's who he is. So anyway, so that, that's the good thing. Now, th the bad thing is they come with attractors. So if you know the science, you know that attractor is a, just any proclivity to, 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 to keep repeating a movement solution in a specific way. Now, the good thing about him is his attractors weren't very deep. So I didn't have to do, I didn't have to change practice that much to, to perturb the, the well. I could basically give him some new task directives. I could give him a new uh, objective focus and he would almost correct himself within a week or two. So again, for him, those attractors weren't set too deeply. So, I, mean, he, I mean, he again, he's special, but typically though, those attractors sometimes are set deep and so that's the negative to getting somebody with who's already had training in them. They may have all the good, the good psychological and physical habits, but they will have propensities towards behaviors that can be very difficult to change. And that's the hardest thing that I've experienced with uh, taking on learned players. <clears throat> and, and then those beginners, you, you obviously don't have those attractors going through, but well, it's the opposite, right? So with the new player, I can, it's easier for you to solve the attractor problem because I'm seeing them develop from day one. Mm -hmm. And so once I see one start to start to emerge, I can like, I can uh, add some variability to practice or add some novelty to break it up, to, to disturb it, you know? And so that's the easy part. The hard part is beginners are coming in uh, with, uh, with that, those good habits not built. So I've got to teach them how to be consistent, how to be disciplined, how to be serious, how to eat right, how to sleep right, how to recover, how to know when they're doing too much training. So I have to teach them how to be an athlete. And like I said, we're dealing with, we're dealing with pedestrians. So a pedestrian has no idea what an athlete does. They've never seen a D1 athlete before. They've never seen a professional before. So, you know, like I said, they've only seen Rocky, right? So <laughs> they think you're chasing girls, eating pizza and running upstairs screaming is the way you get to discipline. They don't realize it's this fucking monotonous daily schedule that you have to be totally dialed into uh, to reach the level of skill that you want. So anyway, that's that's the difficulty. So it's it's flip-flopped. Yeah, that, that's fun. I've never, I never even thought about that with jujitsu. For some reason, I just thought like, the typical person going to jujitsu class would be just like a fucking hardo wrestler. Like you would get the athletes. That's, that's funny that you still have to deal with that kind of general population. I just would never predict that. Well, check this out. Here's the sad part about it. We do get wrestlers who are interested, but a lot of the wrestlers are turned off because of current jiu-jitsu culture. It's too soft for them, mm. right? They're used to the hard nose practices. They're used to sweating until they burn. They're used to that physicality that that coach getting them motivated and telling them to go beat their training partner up man hit that guy with as many singles as you can you know wrestle him to the ground they're used to that language they're used to that feeling but when they go into your typical self-defense you know doing it because you don't want to hang out with your wife at night class that guy has no culture there that is reminiscent of where he came from so he's, he's like, ah, jiu jitsu sucks they're just a bunch of butt scooters who don't want to actually fight but when they come to our school I always get the same thing. Hey, this feels like my college wrestling practice. This feels like my college wrestling practice because it's supposed to be. It's the same fucking thing. So <laughs> yeah. anyway. No, that, uh, that, that's awesome. Uh, so we attract them. 
Uh, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is breaking up those attractors because that that's something that a, a lot of people are super interested in. How you do just that? One, how what are you picking up on when you're watching that? Like, uh, is it the, the certain moves that are happening a couple times? Like, how how are you picking that up? And then how are you interjecting yourself? What are some of the constraints that you're laying? Could you maybe even just break an example yes, if, if sure. you have one in your head of of yep. how you're laying out a practice like that? You're watching it in live because this is also the other thing that I, I just want to touch on here. Like when people look at the ecological approach or the game-based approach or whatever you want to call it, like coaches that have that analytical mind will be like, it's just the lazy way of coaching. It's like, it's you're, you're not you're, exactly because you're, you're live, you're on your feet, you're having to come up with these solutions on a problem. So I just love to hear, hear your thoughts on that with the way you were talking about that. I'm like, oh, this, this is going to be good. Uh, novelty. Novelty is the secret. So if you see somebody, okay, so as we we add variability to practice. So let's say we're, we're working on, let's say hip degeneracy, where we want to get our student to organize around pinning our opponent's hips to the ground in variable ways, okay? So let's say we have two main mechanisms to do, to do this. We can access the hips or center mass with our arms, or we can access center mass with our legs. And so let's say we set out a, a practice schedule over three months where this is the main focus. Now, students will start to be able to perform this outcome eventually. And then each day, we vary up how this, how we do this from practice to practice from each week. We change the same concept, get to the hips, but we do it in different ways and we do it with different people. We have a rule. You work with one partner for the whole day. The next partner you work with, you can't work with the same partner two days in a row. So we're always getting new bodies in variable situations, performing similar tasks with similar outcomes. Now, when a behavior starts to emerge, I can see, let's say one of my students does it really well on this guy, right? And let's say when he tries to go with another guy, he tries to do it the same way he did it to that guy and it doesn't work. Once he tries again, I can see how he tries to apply what just happened. Is he reading the situation in real time? If he tries to repeat the same solution and keeps failing, I know there's an attractor being formed. If I can see him adjust in real time, even though he might not reach full success, but have a little bit and he starts keeping adjusting until he gets it, I know there's no attractor. So it's basically, we use variation to keep them from forming but we also use variation to see when they're forming. If you can only do something in one way against one person, that is an attractor. That means you can't change the way you're solving the problem. Again, you're very attuned and coordinated around that guy, around that movement uh, in that way. So again, we use variation to try to make them not form often. We use variation to uncover them. And then we use novelty to break them. So once it's formed, I, and my, if my student is deep in the shit and they can't figure out the problem because he keeps doing it the same way, first I ask him to see if he's even aware that he's doing it the same way. And if not, I'll just change the task, but I'll keep it similar, right? I'll say, okay, I want you to do the same thing, but I want you to start with your body facing that way, okay? Or I'm going to have you do the, try to do the same thing. We're going to start out here with your hands here. So I basically try to get them to see it a different way without telling them to see it a different way. So I try to stimulate that, you know? Um, does that make, does that make sense to you? Oh yeah. 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 That, okay. that, that, that's fucking fire. That, that, that's very, very similar to what we're doing with the, the football world. When you're, uh, like what, what's, what's when, when you're talking about this with your athletes, uh, what is your, do you, do you have like an end of session, like breakdown and kind of explain how you do it? Cause this is one thing I, I know I have myself, I, I'm seeing all these things and I'm working with it. And I realize a lot of times, like I got to get better at at the end of the session, telling the athlete what we were working on there sometimes and just like going sure. through, because especially with the beginners too. Um, and I've noticed this a lot and it's why it's made me better at it too, is beginners are just so like, they just have no idea what's going on and you almost have to boost their confidence and tell them like, this is why we're doing it. Cause when you are drilling, one of the benefits of like drilling something over and over again is they can feel like, Oh, I did that because I started here and I did there. Whereas um, sometimes if it, if it is a messy practice, they could be like, Oh, what the fuck just happened type thing. So <laughs> like, yeah. I, I just like, I'd like to hear like, what, what's your communication with your athletes and, and how you're, you're going about that. So the first thing I go about is I try to change their expectation. Like I said earlier, I'm dealing with a pedestrian. So I want them to, I want to convince them that practice is confusing. It's mm -hmm. difficult. And you're not going to feel yourself getting better at first. So first, I just try to let them feel that. Like, I want you to feel that. I want you to feel that confusion. I want you to feel that difficulty because this is what it's going to be like. But I want you to be okay with it. Because if you're not okay with it, it's going to be hard to pers pursue this skill. Because you're going to feel that sensation a lot. It might take you three weeks to get a little semblance of understanding. It may take you three months. But if you're comfortable with that discomfort upon starting, you're more likely to be okay with that as you continue because it only gets worse. Okay. Because when you're skilled, trying to add a new skill to a skilled player is brutal. It's much harder than adding a new skill to a beginner. 
So first I change the culture, love failure, love trying, love trying again. You know what I mean? Like, again, set the expectation. Uh, the second thing I do is I do not give feedback about what's happening until I see everyone struggling. I have this kind of rule with, I, I won't talk about it until it's room wide, right? And at the room wide, I would say 65, 70% in my eyes. Like if I'm looking around and it's like, I see like more than half the room looking confused as fuck. I'll be like, all right, guys, let's circle up, you know, time, you know, good job with your stuff. Okay, and then I'll try to give them a why. I'll say, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is what we're organizing around. And this is what I'm seeing. So let's reframe it. Let's try it a different way. So I try to erase it from their mind. Okay, let's look at it this way now and try again. That helps. But if you do that too often, too soon, before they're actually experiencing a problem, they'll ignore it. So I tell a lot of coaches, don't try to solve the problem that hasn't presented itself yet. Let the problem present, then solve the problem. Because they're, they're, if, it's, if it's room wide, they're perceiving it too. They know something's wrong. They're not getting it. And so if you see that, then now we have a common line of communication that we can orient all this bullshit to. Um, so that's, again, those are the two things to do. So set the expectation, wait for the problem to arise, and then reorient the definition, objective, task measures so that we can refocus their intention and attention to help them more clearly define what they're trying to get out of this practice. Mm. And then the last thing that I do uh, is I, uh, and I don't do this with the beginners. Okay. Because there's actually so much going on for them. I want them to, I want that diffuse state to happen after they leave practice. I want their minds to kind of drift and I want them to experience it with their own thoughts, not my words, but with my, with my full students, the guys who are seven days a week, we do a lot of, um, theoretical discussion. So after practice, we'll literally talk for an hour. We'll just kind of share with each other what we're experiencing, what we're seeing. I'll, I'll give my perspective, look at their perspective, and we'll try to highlight the way we're perceiving how practice is going. Um, we do this a lot on Sundays also because we have like a, a private practice early in the morning and we sit around for about two hours afterwards, just theory crafting, you know, the week, the day, the thoughts. And I do this also with my weaker. So I have some of my my main core group who aren't as good as the others. And we do a thing an hour every Friday where you sit back and where I'm, I'm starting to implement this more, by the way. So uh, we sit back and discuss their problems and try to help them come up with new ways to solve their problems. So yeah, we do we do it all. But again, I, this is this is the scheduling. So again, expectation problems once it arises and then with the people who are fully dedicated i try to meet meet with them on the regular and have talks about how practice is going yeah th th that's freaking awesome what's the average age of, of your group 25 to 40 okay so okay. It's, it's a it's like a 50 that's the big group now what i'm noticing is that since i've gone down this path now to do doing all live training the age range has reduced mm. so we're starting to get the younger more motivated guys and girls right uh and this is a good sign this isn't a negative it might not be the best for business, but it is fantastic for producing skilled athletes because you want the younger, tougher person in here who's motivated to train and has the time to train because there is a, a correlative effect between volume, frequency, and skill. And so, again, older men and women might not have the time it takes or the mental or physical energy it takes to really get skilled. So anyway, I just noticed that the age group has has backed off into the, the lower ranges. Well, and I asked that question because one of the things that I noticed like recently going into in, like, especially the high school and, and younger college, the, the longer I'm going, the more it's like, you, you talk about that expectation of failure. It's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be messy. Um, the amount of eyes that like, especially when I was working at the division one level, our freshman class, like we would do something. And as soon as they would get done, it was look for me for approval. Like, did okay. I do that right? Like it was as soon as, as soon as it was done, they would look to me. Did I do that right? And then you want to get like, don't give, I try like trying to break them out of that feedback loop of you don't need that. Like, did it feel right? And, and especially like when they would, would start to come and, and the way that you talked about, like trying to, I just had this realization because I've trained my gym so much now to where they're asking better questions and, and they're, yes. they're, they're, they're answering themselves and they're, they're embracing it. But I remembered when I was back in the college sector, man, that's all I hadn't trained them yet. We had just started this kind of method and everything we had done was, did I do that right? And, and trying to train that athlete to, well, did you like, let's have that conversation. Like, what did you feel? What did you, how did you solve that movement problem? What, what was going on there? Um, but that that's what I've noticed with that with that younger population, especially just typically off the streets uh, when it's not like my, my, my group right now is so biased because I, I we've, we've just, like they're, <laughs> yeah. just, they're so good. They're so easy to work with. But when, when you go into a different setting or go into a high school, it's just like 
we, we've indoctrinated these kids into looking for approval in everything they do movement wise. And I just feel like it destroys a lot of the beauty that is movement and their, their, their ability to like self-organize because they're always looking for that external advice. And that's not to say you can never give external advice or external validation or whatever it is. It's just that the best athletes don't do that. The best athletes. Oh, know. You're absolutely right. They don't. That's they, fucking they weird. Don't. They don't. It's, yeah. At all. <laughs> yeah. I, zero. It's so crazy. My best guys that have ever trained ask the least questions. <laughs> yeah, because they, they almost like they, it's almost like when you when you watch them, it's like they know, like they, their body knows they saw, and, and they're just self organizing so well. And, and like you said, they they've, they've probably self organized so well since they've been a kid that they haven't needed that like fix me mentality. For sure, because there's nothing to, there's nothing broken. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the thing is, is I, I like the way you frame that whole thing because that's sort of what I experience and I try to break too. So. One, I I make a, a I'm not dealing with children, I'm dealing with adults, you know. So I'm like, I'm not daddy, okay. I'm not fucking daddy. Like, you're not gonna get my approval, okay. I, I'm here to help you become better. Like, do you want to get better? Great. Start an- learning how to analyze yourself first. Don't look for me. Look at yourself. And I also I give this uh, funny thing. I, I call if someone does it enough, I call them a domesticated dog. So there's this there's this difference between wolves and domesticated dogs. Where if you have a wolf solve a problem, like if you have a piece of meat in a cage, that wolf will dig at the floor and dig at that cage until they're bloody. They won't once look at for the human for help. A domesticated dog will tug at it a little bit and sit down and look back like, oh, owner, please get this meat for me. So like, do you want to be a fucking wolf or do you want to be a domesticated dog? Come on. So anyway, uh, I try to teach people, though, how to be self-critical and how to ask critical questions. So the first thing I ask is, am I doing it right? If they ask, am I doing it right? Was it effective? Yes, great. That's the start. Uh, uh, Right and wrong is a spectrum. Effectiveness is our first form of right. And then as we get better at this, it becomes more efficient, meaning we can do it at a lower energy cost in a timely manner against a wide variety of people. <clears throat> so again, we gain consistency at a low energy cost in a timely manner. And that's what we're that's what we're looking for. That's efficient. So anyway, so did it was it effective? Great. Okay. Now, if it wasn't, do you know why? What did you try to do? What result did you receive? And I, I tell all these coaches, we look for consistent consistency. People are gonna be tired of hearing me say this shit. Consistency and failure and success is equally valuable. So if you can ask me about the way you're consistently failing, then I know my feedback will have value. If you don't even know why you're failing yet, you haven't looked at it enough. You haven't tried enough. Go try it again. If you can tell me what's happening, we can have a deeper discussion. Because again, I want them invested in their trial and error. I want them invested in themselves. I want them really analyzing who they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so we have to teach that behavior as coaches because it doesn't come in born in everybody like you you mentioned. The top athletes, like like we both suggest, they've been doing it since they were kids. So it's sort of an inborn mechanism based on how they came up. But again, these these average folks just don't understand that yet. Yeah. And, and, and I think we both have uh, one, one. I want to go on a couple of points here. But the, the first yeah. one is that the, the wolf is trainable. Like, as you know, like getting an athlete, I, I talk about like trusting your own body, like getting an athlete to do that. It is trainable as long as like, you can just take your E because this is another thing that, that I've talked about for a lot of times, but it's like, we as coaches want to be wanted, you know, like it's one of the ego things in us of we want to answer that athlete's question when they come to us with what did I do wrong? And, and you see it. And I know I did it when I, especially like at my first internship ever, when I was still in college, it was like, it felt so good to like, oh, you're doing this. I can give you the answer. I can provide something for you. I can be a value. Um, and, and so it's like, we, we, we create these domesticated dogs for our own good. Like yeah, we, we've, we've agreed. We, we pretend like it, it, we're doing the athlete good, but if you really take a step, couple steps back or like, you know, just take that psychedelic view on it and look at it be like, <laughs> you know, like you are doing that for your own good. You are doing that 100%. to get that little dopamine hit of, oh, I'm important. I matter in this session. So like, you can get out of that. And we, we need to stop lying to ourselves because if you go on Twitter, like strength conditioning, Twitter, man, it is the biggest like virtue signaling thing ever. It's like this, you are not doing that for the athlete. You are not saying that for the athlete. This is all just so like dopamine virtue signaling. Some coach is going to tell me I'm doing such a good job and give me a pat on the head. It's like, Oh, that you're destroying that. You're domesticating that athlete for your own good. So that, that, that's a rant that I got there, but no, I agree with that. The other thing that that I'm really interested in, because this is something that is always, I'm I'm always looking for the balance for like, you're you're talking that it's it's the the effective piece is, is is very telling because it's like did it work or did it not? That part for me is not not it's not easy, but it's like you you can see it it worked or it didn't. Yep. The efficient piece is, is something that I struggle with 
not falling back into you need to fix this for it to be efficient. Like looking for simple fixes to like, how do you balance making it efficient without turning into like uh, a biomechanic guy to where it's like, oh, it's just, you need just to have your elbow here. And I'm thinking like a baseball specifically where it, it's really bad in that world of like, it's so into simple fixes to super pro- problems that are super complex. But how do you stay out of that when you're looking for efficiencies and small tweaks that could make that difference? Like how do you fall out of those patterns and work on that efficiency piece? Well, I know that ultimately it's going to be their focus of intention or not tension and a, and a search for an outcome that's going to do it. I believe in self-organization. So what I do is I really try to focus in on the task. How many different ways can I give them task orientation to help them reach that conclusion? So rather than inundate them with solution or something specific, I inundate them with task. If it didn't work that way, try it this way. Change your focus. Focus here then. Focus there. Focus there. And so I just get them to learn to, to know that it will come from the environment. We have to keep searching. You know what I mean? So by communicating with them about their search, that's how I quicken it. So rather than doing that, the ego pleasing is I'll just tell them to put their elbow here. Well, I, I constrain myself because the truth is I don't believe that me telling them to put their elbow here will solve the problem because that would suggest that I have all the answers. I don't believe I have all the answers. I believe the environment has all the answers. So if I can help them navigate the environment, they're going to find it just like I did. And I also know that the details that I came up with are going to be different than the details you come up with. So again, I just keep reminding myself that this is true. This is a fact. Help them search, help them find it, give, give them as much energy as they're putting in and it will come out. So again, I just don't, I, cause even if I tell them, put your elbow here, I might've created it, something I can't erase now. If I told them that they're, they're going to start focusing on their elbow and that could take them further from the goal. So I'd rather their success or failure be lost in their own attempt to discover than my ego driven attempt to make myself feel, feel better by giving them a specific explanation. God damn, that, that was fucking good. <laughs> good. Good rant there, man. That, 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 that was a good way to put it. Um, what's what's your uh I just thought about this. What what's the uh retention rate with new beginners that come and try your gym? Like, are they leaving? Because I I've had I've had two different ways at our gym. They they go and they're addicted fucking right away and they're like, oh my god, this is it, this is amazing. Or two, they're 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 just like it's just that they, they want. They, they want to be a domesticated dog. It, it, like yeah. you, you have, you have athletes that come in. I, I, I have athletes that come in that they want to be a do- domesticated dog. I tell them I'm not going to do that. Um, and I, I'm, I don't really hold hands either in that sense either, but I'm yeah. like, I, I'm not going to domesticate you. I'm not sitting here doing that. Um, so what, what's kind of the retention rate with, with those athletes? So n- not very high because that, that's what they're coming here for. So if you're coming in here to meet daddy and to have your hand held, you're not going to like me. You're going to meet me. I'm too abrasive. I'm too intense. I speak too quickly. You are not going to like me. And I accept that. I'm not everybody's coach. I'm not looking to be everybody's coach. And I don't even, I'm not looking for everyone to fucking like me either. Like I only care about my job. Now, if you end up sticking around, I will give you everything that's inside me to help you reach your goal. I'll sleep here. I'll travel wherever. I will talk to you crying at two in the morning because you overtrained for eight months and you, you can't eat another bite of your protein bar, whatever the fuck your problem is, I'm with you. But either way, you have to accept the way we do things here because this is how we do things here. But again, I'll tell them, hey, there's a gym down the street. There's a gym down the street. There's a gym down the street. So my retention rate for the guys who come here to truly learn is high. The guys that stay, stay. And then, but I can tell upon walking in whether someone's going to stick around or not. I can tell right away. And I, because also too, and (laughs) Like I said, I have personality problems. So there's, I, I have that barrier for myself. I'm not the friendliest guy on the planet. So like, sometimes I won't even greet people because I'm like, if you're coming into my world, so if I'm, I'm teaching and you come in late and you don't have the balls to walk up and do yourself to me, I'm not speaking to you for the rest of the time you're standing there. <laughs> I don't have to. So anyway, uh, so my gym has a very special culture. It's very free. It's very open. There's no tradition. You come and go as you please. I'm not daddy. You don't ever have to explain yourself to me. And so there's a lot of people who like that and they want that freedom. They want that environment. They want to learn like that. And there's others who just don't. So like I said, the guys who sign up stay, but they're, it's infrequent because most people truly don't really want to do this. They think they did mm. because they, they read a Reddit post or they watched a video from 2002 with people in their uniforms spinning in a circle and it looked real cool to them. But when you come into a room that's 90 degrees with a bunch of sweaty people man, really going after it, you realize very quickly whether or not that's for you. Mm. So I don't know. I, I, it, it's very, this, my environment is very stable, but again, it, it attracts a very specific clientele. 
Yeah. And, and that, that's the best way to do it for me anyways, too, because like the, the, the culture able to build up then is amazing. You, you talked about how you can tell right away when somebody comes in, if it's going to work or not. Well, I like, I have so many telltale signs. Like the, I do a couple things on purpose. Like the, the, our gym is kind of, it, it's in this building uh, and our old gym was in the same similar spot, but it's, it's kind of hard to like find the door of like oh, getting shit. into so like <laughs> go, go, go. uh when, when, when they get there uh, i just send them the address and like one of the biggest telltale signs is can they figure out how to get in and, dude and- i have the same thing yeah. i have the same gonna- thing we call it the two door problem if you can't figure out to check the other door get the fuck out of here this gym's not for you <laughs> yeah it's, and it's like it's like when when they get here like and i can see them pull up too so this is the thing it's like when they pull up, do they get out and check a couple doors? No. Or do they do they get on their phone and instantly call or text? I'm like, okay, that, that's your first red flag. Second one is you know, talking about the introduction, like when they walk in and again, like business people are like, oh, this is a terrible business thing. Like, you need to, but like when they walk in, I just let them like, like how do they interact with people? I sit, so like it, there's a long walkway into our gym and I kind of usually sit at the back. I'm at the, at the board, uh, let every, like all the athletes kind of mingle before we start. And then they'll come back to the board and we start. Um, and I don't pull that athlete in. I don't tell them like, Hey, everybody, John's Man. here today. Um, when he walks in, I, I just see like, how are you interacting with people? I, or who do you go to first? Um, and the athletes that stay, man, it's like, even if they're introverted and, and shy, like they'll just go up to somebody and be like, Hey, I'm new here. Like, and they, they, they yeah, talk yeah. and the athletes that want you to be daddy, it's like, they won't say anything or they'll go to you right away. And be like, th- like this type of thing. But, uh, do you have, a, do, uh, you talk about the two door problem. I'm interested. Do you have any <laughs> other things that like that, that you no, kind of do or it's notice? It's so crazy. Like, first of all, whatever we're experiencing on our worlds are the same. So the shit you're experiencing football is the same shit that I'm experiencing here. But yeah, that, that two door problem is hilarious. So we have, uh, we have two doors and two garage bays. That's it. Okay. Our, our facility is small. It's 4,000 square feet. You know, it's not that big. So uh, one door is always locked. We never open it. We have two garage bays in the main door. Okay. Which is always kind of cracked. You can, you can see it, right? We'll have people and I'll, we'll be working out or something. They'll be banging on the locked door and be looking in the window, waving at me. And we wave back and keep going about what we're doing. And they'll stand there. Like they won't even go to the other door and it's not, we were in a, it's not like it's hidden either. Like just go to the other fucking door. Anyway. Yeah. We have people call, Hey, I'm outside. I don't know how to get in. I'm like, uh, it's a door. Open the fucking door. How do I open it? Pull on it. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I had the same thing. I have another thing too. If, if somebody calls me to say, Hey, I'm interested in jujitsu. I'm like, okay, we talk and they say, what's your schedule? Nope. Ah, I'll see you later, pal. I'm done with this conversation. This is 2023. What do you mean? What's my schedule? You, I bet you've been on Instagram all morning, yet you can't click on my fucking website and look at our schedule and get out of here. So yeah, it's the same thing, man. I, uh, it's wild. People are crazy. Oh, but oh yeah, the, the culture of walking in. I, and I actually like that because it lets people know how serious they are, right? So if you're too afraid to put your feet on the mat and come say hi, you're not going to like confrontation. Like grappling is confrontational. You're going to be asked to mount a stranger tonight and smush them you're going to be asked to get on top of them sweaty and hot and you're going to be asked to hold them down and if you can't come in and say hi my name is john oh i don't think you picked you pub trivia is down the street go do that like you know yeah. like, tw- 24 hour fitness man they, they have a guy at the front they'll meet and greet you and try to sell you on their 10 dollar month program as soon as you walk in go, go there and 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 the, the the people that are that the, the business people like they, they'll listen and be like well that that's that's bad for business it's bad whatever it's like I promise it's not. I promise it's not because you're pulling the right people and you're just doing, and this is like what I like about the Instagram too. It's like, you can just weed so many people out. Like the schedule thing, like you can just weed people out and then you're not expending time and energy on things that aren't, they're not going to make you money in the long term. They're not going to grow your business. They're not going to grow your culture in the long term. So it's like, we're, we're playing long-term games with long-term people as Naval talked about, instead of like trying to just pull 20 bucks for somebody out of a class that you're going to spend more mental energy then that 20 bucks will ever be worth whatever it is. You I, know? Like, so it's like, it is good for business. That's the other thing. Like it's building your culture for long term. I completely agree with you. And like we, for example, we don't even charge mat fees. Everyone in the world can come here and train for free. Like if, if you're, say you're visiting for a month and you're from like, you know, five States over, but you're going to be here for like, a, like three weeks, four weeks, because you have, you have a quick job up here. Come train with us. You know what I mean? Because the thing is, is there's more to business than the bottom dollar. There's the reputation that you create the character of your gym, the culture of your gym, the people. I mean, it's such a complex web of, of interaction. Now, of course, you want certain business practices in place that, you know, people feel good signing the contract, giving you their money, talking with you about what their expectations are. So you, 
you want that, but outside of that, everything else is 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 it's ridiculous. We don't, we don't need it. We don't need it. I don't need your extra 20 bucks or extra 40 bucks. What am I going to do? Go have a meal? Like, what the <laughs> hell is it going to do for me? I'd rather you have a good experience, have some fun, do some real training and go back and tell your friends about it. That's what I'd rather have, you know? So no, I, I agree with you, man. Absolutely. Okay. La la last couple of questions. One last one on yeah, jujitsu. And then I want to get into some of your off mat stuff that you do, or if you do it. Okay. Um, But last one on jujitsu. What's kind of your, your future? Do, do you have a rabbit hole you're, you're kind kind of currently yeah. in that, that you want to kind of unleash in the world or that you're just experimenting with that core group? I know you talked about like, if you're not willing to break your athletes, like if you're not really experiment on this core group, like you're probably not going anywhere. Is there anything that you're like, ooh, this could be something um, that, that I'm going to take to the next level? Yeah, so the first thing is my first mission is just to change the practices in our community. Mm. Like I want real coaches to, to dedicate themselves to this, not just school business owners. I want real coaches to start emerging out of here. Uh, and I want real practices to go on. No matter what you decide to do with your gym, if you're going to practice jiu-jitsu, I'd like to help you do it efficiently and effectively. So that's the that's the niche I'm trying to fill here. I'm trying to be a coach's coach. I'm trying to help coaches find a better way to do this. So that's the niche I'm trying to fill here. But personally, I'm trying to take self-organization as far as I can do it applied to my sport. So I'm trying to erase all tradition and convention even up to how we call and name the positions. I'm trying to strip it down and making it as foundational as possible. How much do we have to say and how, how, how well do we have to organize practice in a specific way to get the outcomes we're looking for? Can we produce a different type of grappler using this? Like the grappler we, we see 15, 10 years, 20 years ago, can we transform the way that looks? Can we create a complete grappler? Someone who knows how to go from the feet to the floor with submissions involved in an efficient and effective way, no matter what their alignment is. And again, how simple can we get at training that type of athlete? So I'm just, I'm literally trying to strip it down and rebuild it. So that's, that's my personal, personal goal. And I, I have like a group of eight guys who are here do, do with on the journey with me, right? So eight specific guys who are doing everything in their power to try to help show the world how we're organizing and doing this. No, that's freaking awesome. All right. La la last one before we, uh, I'll let you go here. Um, What's been kind of your your off mat uh, training? Because I'm I'm always like I I just look like it's I look at your guys's like positions you guys find yourself in and, and the, the strength required the mobility required the power like I love MMA I love jujitsu for that reason just because it's like that some of that stuff of it, like that's unbelievable like if you were just looking oh, yeah. at an athlete just doing that random position like what just happened but it's moving so fast or it's like people just don't notice the things that are happening there when you're breaking out a video and watching it so. What does kind of the, the, the off mat training look like? Is most of it done on the mat and that that's where that mobility and strength level is coming from? Because I know a lot of that for contract contact prep for football wise, it's like a lot of the contact prep and, and strength stuff we do is a lot of wrestling stuff, like because yeah, yeah, they're sure. required to move another human. But what's that look like for, for you guys? So we do, honestly, we do very traditional strength conditioning practices. I mean, not traditional in the sense that we just, we're training like a, a bodybuilder or a power athlete or strength athlete. We use the protocols that they use to develop these things in a non-specific way. So we have a guy that we work with named Rob Wilson. Uh, he's a trainer out here on the East Coast, uh, and he's a, a strength conditioning coach. He works with special forces. He works with military. Uh, but he's he was actually uh, DeAndre Corbe's original strength conditioning coach, and we got introduced. And so he's been helping me understand this process better, like you know how to use exercise that not only strengthen but protect soft tissue. Um, or what types of movement patterns and protocols get the stimulus response that we're looking for. Anyway, so we kind of go down into that area. So anyway, we typically do uh, the athletes who are willing to dedicate to it, strength conditioning protocols that sort of resemble anywhere from power production to a light level of hypertrophy and anywhere in between, because that's sort of the, uh, the mode we're operating in out here in our sport. So again, we just try to strengthen our weaknesses that way uh, as best we need to help us adapt to the rigors of the sport we're playing. We don't go too far beyond that. And, and how about some of the, the one of the interesting things I'm always interested in, in jujitsu is, is like that mobility piece. Is is that from just finding those positions pretty consistently on the mat or, or are you guys doing yeah. something else? Outside? No, no, no. We honestly, I mean, everyone has their own mobility routine. Some people are like interested in, in loaded stretching, PNF stretching. Some people don't like me myself. I'm very mobile. I don't, I don't have to do any stretching. I can put my legs behind my head. I could just, I was a kid. Uh, so I don't know if like jujitsu sort of tracks that type of body. Uh, or it produces that type of body. I can't really tell. Mm. Um, but we are in positions where we're dropping down into the splits. We're putting our head in funny places. We're getting our arms stretched. So I think it really is we're organizing around these angles of pressure often. So we sort of understand where our, um, 
how far that alignment can go before something bad happens. Because the truth is, a submission is taking a joint and putting it in a very extreme angle continuously until it snaps. So, like, again, that's an aspect of what we do and also how we line up. So, I don't know. I guess we get used to it. But we don't do anything. Our gym doesn't do anything specifically to train that. Gotcha. Uh, what would you say when, when, when you're looking at an athlete that the typical, I want to say beginner athlete where, they, where they're just chubby and out of shape, but yeah. what would you say is the biggest like physical constraints that, that you see with, with a jujitsu athlete? You, are you mean constraints or limiting factors? So, uh, uh, like, 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 uh, is there a, a strength constraint where if, yeah. if they had, they had a higher level of strength, they, they would be able to perform that move, a uh, power constraint, mobility constraint. Is, yep, yep. is there something that's kind of typical with a, uh, jujitsu athlete or, or how do you view that even? I would say the most coveted one is durability or endurance, mm. being able to withstand high volume practice over a long period of time, because that's going to allow us to put as much skill into you as possible. The more we can pr practice our sport, and I, I say more, I don't know what that minimal effective dose is, but I do know that at a higher frequency, at a higher volume, skill comes out in a different way. And uh, there, there are some people that we can push those upper echelons of, of uh, recoverability from that level of stress. So people who can endure practice and can endure training bouts that are you know hard to get through this is what we covet this is what we want because we can do more training um i think i don't know i wouldn't say like flexibility plays a role in bottom position um because it allows you to put your body in these really contracted strange spots that are hard to extend so it can be very it can give you a an attribute that helps you protect your center uh, i would say strength allows you to apply force to the opponent and, and and especially within negation like if somebody has my arm and i'm a very strong athlete yanking my arm back and not letting it be controlled is something that strong people tend to have an attribute towards uh so i don't know there, there's it's differences and they have different response uh, responses here in our environment but like i said the most coveted i think is endurance and, and how, how do you train that endurance because you, you're saying endurance almost in like the, the durability like the ability to that's really how i mean it that's yeah. honestly how I mean it. I don't, because the thing is, is the, the, the way you breathe, your heart rate, the, everything changes so drastically in, in a combat sport. It's never just super high. It's never low. It's kind of always changing. You know, we'll go from an isometric state to a hard contraction, uh, you know what I mean? Into nothing. And then we'll do that action again. So again, there's so much variability, even in the way our bodies respond. So our ability to stay within those variable states for an extended period of time, I think is what I mean by endurance. So a durability might be a better word for it. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, our, I, so we train that through, through the practice. So okay. what we try to do is you try to orient our students focus around getting used to that high volume and then learning how to recover. It seems like that high volume only hurts and that high frequency only hurts the jiu-jitsu athlete if other things in their life are not buttoned down. So if they have relationship problems, if they have financial problems, if they have job problems, these seem to be greater contributing factors to how well the athlete does in practice as far as being able to uh, endure it and also to recover from previous bouts. So we train endurance by high volume, high frequency, and then we teach our athletes how to recover. And that works for us. Well, yeah. Well, coach, this was awesome. Thank you for being on. Yeah, man, I, this is, this is great. This is different than, than what I typically do. So yeah, it's fun to talk to someone new about some different shit. Perfect. Thank you guys for listening. Keep chopping wood. Yeah, man. Thank you for listening. Join us next week as we dive down another rabbit hole. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a five-star rating. Follow us on Instagram at Austin Yoakum to stay updated on future podcast guests. Keep chopping wood.